Oh, funny seeing you here. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I've been having a, a whale of a time with oh. VR. You're in this room. You're in this meeting too. Oh, hi, Jay. <laughs> we should we should have stayed in the same room we were in. I well, would it have changed in the Discord? I'm the, joking. Like, is oh, okay. we're in room forty-seven, three stroke twelve on the sixth sure. floor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, Randall. Um, I've been having a whale of time with um digital things. I, I got so I don't know if I showed us shared a, like a, a capture of the remote control car thing that I've been making. Um, but I also got it working with an actual game controller, and mm. it's just it's it's thrilling um, to have uh, just to kind of um, to to be able to kind of so arbitrarily alternate between kind of physical things like a a, a physical controller and and a, and a virtual one and feel the benefits and things like that. And also like um, my my boss was clearing out a room. Uh, her office and uh, found like this external um, uh, laptop monitor. So you can just plug this in <laughs> next to it. And just, yeah, it, it, the sort of the way in which it sort of renders digital things so much more arbitrarily positioned and placed in amongst the rest of the world uh, is, is, is really cool because it points to things that we will be able to do where digital isn't just in a screen or that it is in a screen is much less important and as a distinction um, than, than it has been in the past. So, yeah. yeah. Nice. Hey, gang. Hey, gang. Hello. Hello. Thank you all for joining. I love that. I love uh, having a little midweek call. Yeah. This is awesome. Um, I had the uh, honor of speaking this past weekend at a BIPOC sustainable fashion conference on Saturday morning, um, which was really exciting. And they asked me to speak about digital fashion, which I thought was hysterical because I was like, I don't really feel like I know what I'm talking about. And they're like, well, you know more than we know what we're talking about. So I was like, all right, if that's, <laughs> if that's the, uh, the caveat here too, or if that's the, the threshold of being able to speak, but it was really awesome. And I ended up sitting next to a guy who has started a metaverse mall. Um, so we have a call coming up this week. Um, hopefully tomorrow may get pushed a week, but it was a really incredible experience because it was mostly people of color. And what I realized is that this community of people in LA, a lot of them are in tech, but a lot of them are getting involved in digital fashion for the same reasons that I've been really interested in it for sort of avoiding the physical waste, the physical product waste. And so um, it was really cool because after the, after the round table discussions, I started talking up um, NFL. And I was like, well, I'm part of this futures lab. And so I think I've got three new recruits that are going to start hopefully joining um, to, I'm like trying to get the chore, the merch department really, you know, not to like try to take it over, but I'm trying to get the merch department to really become its full fledged thing. Yeah. But it was cool. There seems like there's a just, lot. Just a, a quick note, Kemp, you, you have because of your role, because of your showrunner role, you should and and have the ability to send someone an invite. So okay. just let me if if it doesn't work. I mean, and the mechanic for doing it is like a weird kind of right click in an obscure place. Yeah, kind of thing. Um, I can I can I can walk you through how to how to do that. But you do. I'm I'm trying to give people who are. Yeah, you know, like who are who are responsible people, the ability to invite people. Yeah, so it seemed like the two, like the big takeaway that I had was one, that there's a lot of people who are interested in digital fashion and two, that people are interested in it in a non-e-commerce um, tradition platform, right? Like they don't, want to, they don't want to get involved in digital fashion from a let's replicate, let's just make 
fashion items digitally to sell online, right? There's a real strong, um, what is the speculative version of where this could go? So I'm excited about that because I think that aligns very well with near future labs. Um, and so I'm going to have some calls with them this week to see uh, there's three people that I would like to rope in and see if they're interested in getting more involved. But cool. I just thought, you know, Jim, we were talking today through text about the community comment um, or word. And I think it seems like LA has this really big community of people that are trying to get more involved in it, but don't really have a space for that. So I think already I feel like NFL can be kind of, we can provide some somewhat of a, uh, of some, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say space, but you can provide some sort of collection for it. Feels yeah. Like that. Yeah. Hey, Adam. Hey, Adam. Um, so I wanted to kick off and just start talking about this concept that Brandel and I, when we had our call, what was that now, three weeks ago, two weeks ago? Um, we left off on this idea where Brenda really triggered this concept for me to think about taking up digital space. Um, it's not a world that I am particularly versed in. So for those of you, I think Dre, Julian, I've heard you guys talk about this more. Brenda, obviously this is sort of your world as well. Nick, I don't know your expertise that well. But if you guys want to kind of share what you may know about that, I'd love to learn a little bit more or, and or the idea is what is the potential for this coat and these accessories to take up digital space? What are the options for this? Um, what kind of platform can it exist on? This guy that I met with this metaverse mall, you know, do we want this, these objects? Brenda, the thing I really loved about our call was that it's not going to just be an NFT right? Like an NFT illustration, right? I think I had always been thinking about it that way because it was sort of the most accessible, easy way to jump into it. Mm -hmm. um, it's also to me kind of the least interesting. It feels like everyone's doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I really love this idea. And when we were talking about Memoji, just even the way that these little caricatures, like their hair moves or their, their eyes wink, this way that they have a personality that creates an identity is very much how these accessories are starting as they come in these accessories are indicating people's personalities so if the chore coat is supposed to be this sort of blank canvas or this workwear for everybody and these accessories are allowing you to dive into your individual futuristic dumpster diver then i want to see how we can take that individuality and then create that space digitally if mm. that makes sense so I want to open that up and just if anyone has ideas on how we can do that. I mean, I've got some thoughts, but uh, one one thing that might be worth doing to just get our brains going uh, is uh, talk to any 10 year old, you know, about their Fortnite skins and what they want for Christmas. And I think we'll probably learn more by having a conversation with a generation of kids who yeah. who just intrinsically understand the benefits of having digital fashion and being able to per express yourself uh, that way. But but when I think of this, I, I think of, um, and I agree with you, I think the NFT, th I love the NFT idea, but to me, that's just a, that's a technological thing to make it non-fungible, -fung right? It's not mm -hmm. the thing itself. It's just something mm -hmm. to, 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 to make it unique and, and um, to validate ownership is really what it is. As far as mm -hmm. the, the coat itself, it's like, you know, the, the taking up space digitally, you know, we use the term metaverse. I think the idea of like a, um, you know, as, digital things become more interoperable as Epic decides one day that they're going to make things in Fortnite compatible with things in other games that they create. I think that's, that's going to be something, but in be between now and then there's a, there's a place where I, I imagine 
you know, there's a, there's a wardrobe, there's a closet, maybe there's some kind of a closet that you can store your digital things in. And the, the near future lab chore coat is that first digital thing that you're able to put in there. And, and you can put it on an avatar and you can make the avatar resemble your Fortnite avatar. You can make it resemble your Minecraft mm -hmm. avatar. Maybe, maybe the core take the, 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 the chore coat takes on, a different shape depending on on what you're doing but I, I just think of it as a mirror this is the outfit of the day hashtag ootd that you do uh, when you want to show off what you're doing and your chore code is going to be different than my chore code because you've done things to it to yours that that, that uh, so i don't know i i, I imagine that there's no one i can't see it living in a lot of different places without a lot of effort but i could see it living mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle where it is a symbol of where it could potentially live in different places. And it's a way for you to uh, snap a screen grab selfie of you wearing your chore coat. Anyways, that's, that's one thought. Yeah. I, I tend to agree, Dre, that the interoperability is kind of a huge barrier right now. And it's probably being worked on by the big dogs, but maybe there's opportunities in I don't know if it's programming or some some sort of way of like, like you said, a, a digital closet where you can export it as a Minecraft skin, export it as your Fortnite skin or your avatar for Gravatar or whatever, you know, where then the NFT aspect comes back to verified, verified ownership of this particular thing. And then our closet is about those accessories. How do you accessorize your your chore coat before you do it. Uh, another way I was thinking was we just go all in on one platform to start, like like Minecraft or Fortnite, where we we work on the chore coat in Minecraft because that's what I live in. I love I love the game, and it's a data pack or it's a mod that you can install and it verifies the ownership and then it allows you to modify your chore coat to hold extra things or decorations and stuff. Um, I think it's it's a matter of like where do we want it to go? Do we want to treat be more broad, or we want to focus in on it, or do you have other ideas? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Randall. Um. So, uh, one of the things that is maybe fashion and and is certainly digital at this point is like, and I, I don't know how much people are using them, but on 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 Apple platforms like uh, iOS, you have these new custom home screens and they have uh, a whole bunch of widgets uh, but they also allow you to configure mood so this is a do not disturb it's a night sort of thing and so it's a whole configuration of different sort of components and it's sort of like um you know you can organize workspaces within you know adobe products photoshop illustrator um and and people do similar things in blender and maya um one of the one of the things that I, I keep coming back to is the, the sort of productive or, or creative um, responsibilities and capacities for fashion, where if you just have a thing that doesn't do a thing, then it does something, but it's just displaying itself. It's not responsible for filtering or creating and things like that. So to some extent, like, you know, when you're, when you're wearing a certain article of clothing, your it it has an impact on how you be and what you make and things like that. A chore code is something that you wear because you're you're doing stuff that has kind of tools and things like that uh, at the ready. Um, so to that end, it's 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 like a workspace. Uh, it's it's like a configuration of tool panels and palettes and things like that. So it could be you know for you know Microsoft Word ninety seven uh, that sort of infamously configurable. Uh, iteration of of an office suite um and uh i think uh, i'm really interested in um uh just really uh asserting that like finding a way to, to, to successfully assert that that is fashion that that is that's the equivalent that's the analog for when when you're um carrying a, a particular uh kind of tote or uh or, or or clutch purse or or jacket, you know that that there are these 
um, there are these things that we we don't understand to be articles about us, uh, articles of, of of accompanying sort of dig, uh, our, our, our sort of actions in digital space. Um, you know, one aspect of it is that they are completely opaque to people on the other side of digital interactions with us. And they're only very slightly apparent to people who are even sort of standing over our shoulder. And so maybe that's something to work on mm -hmm. to say, like, when I'm in this mode, then it, it shows in this way, you know? So if you have a jacket, I um, mean, that's sort of digital, it's sort of not, but like, if you have mood jackets that respond to what mode your phone is in, um, or if you have um, modalities of the way that you present, and so you have a whole pack effectively of like emotes or responses that are uh, reflective of the the overall sort of setup that you have at a given time, then then I, I think that would be a, an interesting thing to try to pull on. Yeah, almost like when Discord says currently playing Scrivener or currently playing Minecraft, like being able to react to that. Is that what you're talking about? Like if it's in this category of game, then the emoji or the, the, the filter sets are different. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, that your, that like, that your, um, that your Minecraft motion is different to, uh, to another one would be maybe, yeah that yeah so like like a, like we were like Kemp and I were talking about Memoji I think that that's that's a really undersold um uh offer because it means that it's it's you and you have an expressive ability like you know board apes you don't have a range an emotional range they don't have anything you can do with them other than slap them on things and they assert that you can put them on a mug and sell them or whatever but um if it's easy to be able to create like responses and reactions through and with mm. them. Uh, and if there's kind of uh, like a, a suite of things that are appropriate to the moment, but are still identifiably coming from a certain origin, then, then that helps, you know, so a typeface is kind of digital fashion. Um, mm. uh, yeah. So like apples, um, M E M O J I emoji. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Android. Yeah. User, so sorry, what, I missed oh, that no. whole conversation. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, yeah. No. So I mean, the, the cool thing about those is uh, on a particularly on a system that has a um uh a, a, a um what they call a true depth camera, um then it does face tracking, and so you can record um speech and then have it kind of go along with it You're, the eyes are a little weird and blinky but um but maybe they're better now um but yeah so then it uh it's a it's a way of being you uh with an appearance that is mm -hmm. very very identifiably um uh, uh custom. emoji like it, it, it's custom, custom it's you but yeah. it's also very clearly emoji. No, nothing nothing um that uh, nothing else looks like Memoji, and maybe that's because Apple's legal. I, I sort of get on it as quickly as possible, but but yeah, like um, so so fashion that allows you to be you in it with it, um, mm -hmm. and still remains sort of recognizably that thing. Um, similarly, and I, I, again, I I don't know like all all of these always on display. So iPhone 14 Pro uh, and also app, all of Apple Watch since Series Five have a display that is is constantly on uh, so people can see it um and i don't know whether that's had an impact on people's sort of fashion choices or decisions about what what goes on there but i think that there's a much much broader scope when you have these persistent displays to consider them sort of articles for for external in sort of incidental viewing as well as for your own indirect mm -hmm. intentional purpose so then that that allows it to sort of join the the, the the canon of 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 surfaces that can consider, consider can can be considered to be fashioned. Something that is coming up as you're talking about this, Brendel, is this idea of world building for me because I've been uh, um, 
I recently had some, some focus groups with some gender fluid folks under the age of 25. And one of the byproducts of that focus group was I got invited to like five different Google Docs for their world building, um, which I didn't realize was a, such a thing now for young people to be using the term world building or narrative building so so frequently. Um, and I think it it's not shocking to me, but that's it sort of became an interesting point of research for me to dive into. But I think right with Fortnite and all these other things that youth have grown up on, the idea of building worlds or building narratives, building identities just funnels right into it all. And a lot of them, I think at the age of, you know, one was 23 or 22 and they're in undergrad and they're an English major. So this is like, not this is something they want to get into more. But this digital accessory and coat feel like they could even have this link to world building, right? Like with this future dumpster diver, there seems to be this identity that people, everyone's identity has been different, right? Which sort of spurred on the accessories, right? The coat was one thing. And then as we did the research on the coat, one thing that came up was that the coat was uniform, but everybody's approach to futuring or the near future or how they future is different. And so then the accessories really stemmed off, broke off in this way of like personal identity. And then, you know, we can't create infinite accessories financially. So then that became a digital element. And then now I'm thinking like, well, does this digital element then give you access to these worlds that people are building? Um, will people build those worlds? I don't know. But Dre, as you were sort of talking, this idea of like these secret passages ways came up and like, is this, does is there a way for this accessory to be a link to something else where like, if you are to click on it, it takes you to a different platform or takes it takes you to our platform. Is Discord a, a platform for us, I guess, but I don't know, I'm thinking out loud here, but mm -hmm. um, somehow this thing taking up space feels like it has the ability to almost act like a, I don't know, is any of that kind of? I think so. I mean, it, it, it sort, of, sort of spurs the idea that people have alter egos and, and like other things that they're sort of feeding or considering in the context of their daily discourse. Can you say a little bit more about this world building that they're doing? Like, what is the, what is the goal of it? And what are the, what are yeah. the, like, is it that they ha they have like alter egos and they're coming up with a canonical shared world in which this thing, this stuff happens? Like, what are they, what are they, what are they doing it for? <laughs> yeah, it's been really cool because so a lot of my research coming, a lot of my consulting research was on Gen Z just to like pay bills. And then with gender, what I found back in the day, let's say five years ago, was that so many trans youth and queer youth were on gaming platforms, right? So they found ways to express their gender fluidity through avatars and skins. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. What I'm now finding is that they're taking that one step further and being like, oh, well, so this character that I've built in Fortnite or these avatars and these skins, like they know who that character is. Like they have an emotional attachment to that. It goes beyond just this game. And so then they start thinking about how that character interacts on a date or in this way that the game doesn't always give them full access to. So I was just talking to this one person from this fo focus group and they just went on and started building this world in a Google doc of these stemming from their gaming experience of these characters that they've created interacting with each other outside of the gaming platform. Um, I think it's largely romantic is the idea that I got. I've only read like the first, it felt a little invasive to be on these because I felt like I was hosting a focus group and now I'm reading your Google Docs. It's like, I don't really know where the ethical divide there is from like a, from like a academic standpoint, but um, figuring that out. But it feels like you're getting a much more personal glimpse into their like emotional world, right? Because a lot of their Fortnite's not really going to necessarily deal with gender and a lot of their world building deals specifically with their gender for this person and then dating and whatnot. Um, and that same week I had a call because I do this fashion call each week too. 
when we were talking about how you're starting to see, especially with Kanye West and Balenciaga and the child pornography stuff, this big shift of the joke. There's a moment in fashion for the last couple of years where people were like, who's the joke on? And is the joke, am I, am I playing into the joke? Is the joke on you? Cause you don't get it basically where somebody can show up at fashion week and be dressed head to toe in Balenciaga, having spent $6,000 on oversized jeans, t-shirt and a bag. And they're considered fashionable. I think now we're starting to realize that not we, I think now there's a pushback on that and people are starting to ask themselves each piece of clothing that you're wearing says something about you and what is the narrative that you're telling so that kind of goes back into this idea of world building so now we're seeing younger tiktok influencers in fashion be like i bought this vintage piece at this store because it feels you know they go into like kind of telling why it's part of their personality or their character um all to say the identity is sort of taking center stage. Whereas a couple of years ago, logo brand and like non-identity was sort of taking center stage. So there's something to all of that that's sort of hitting on this mark of accessory and world building um, that I don't really know what the answer to that is, but I'm seeing that connection somehow. <clears throat> I've done a bunch of, I've done a bunch of world building uh, on client stuff. And I, and I see, I see th there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do, you can do world building. And the, the, you know, I would do it in a very pragmatic sense. And a lot of it was like, you know, you build the world that you, that you wish to inhabit, or you build the world that you want to avoid. And then you use that as a, as a way to do, uh, as a way to think about, um, like strategic foresight scenarios, when I look at design fiction, what I like about design fiction is you don't build the world, you build the thing, and then you extrapolate the world from the thing. Uh, and you uh, create your, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's reverse world building. You don't, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't try to do it so big because when you're doing a uh, big world building, it's typically there's, there's, there's all the macroeconomic forces that you want to consider. And the sun's. Well, exactly. Uh, only sons. What's the nature of the sediment? You know, all that kind of yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. So you get all that stuff, and then you end up with end up with like you know, the, there's your personal world, there's a societal world, there's like the global world, and it, it can get really, really complicated. With design fiction, you just make a thing, and then you start to extrapolate it, and it's a, a way for you to to influence this conjuring of the world with your own with your own weights and biases that you can then compare with other people's, and you can learn. Uh, collectively by like, oh, this is how you see it. This and is you how also, I saw you it. also don't have the answer to everything. To yeah, exactly. So you can come up with the, 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 you're guessing. the, the, yeah. the can, the can of uh, hand choked elk. And you're kind of like, all right, well, what kind of world would this come from? You mm -hmm. haven't figured it all out. They Why? use it as a, yeah. like back to the archeology span thing. It's yeah. a forensic clue. Yeah. And you I, I build use all this... the infrastructure. Yeah. In, in the world of archeology, span there's this, uh, there's this uh, dodecahedron, with little balls on the corners and different size holes and they're found all over the place and no one knows what it's for. Whoops, stop it. No one knows what it's for. And that's what I love about it. It's like, oh, here's a thing that we find and we're, we've mm -hmm. got some ideas. We think it might be a template for like a crochet style knitting template, but we're not in, in, in we're not entirely sure what it is. And this, this is what I'm liking about design fiction, but to go back to this idea of like the, the, the coat and identity, something else that I've been thinking a lot about that, that I heard uh, on a podcast a couple of years ago is this uh, idea of um, uh, physical and digital primacy and the distinction between the two. And we live in a world now where some people might be digital prime. They'll actually care more about their virtual uh, avatar and identity than they do about their physical one. And we, we, we're seeing the beginnings of it with like Instagram, right? We have Instagram influencers who it's really about how they look like they'll go to an amazing location, take that amazing selfie, project that onto the world, but not actually enjoy 
this amazing place they went to visit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's the beginnings of that, but then you see it very, very strongly in gaming, hardcore gaming communities, people who are addicted to Warcraft who have more friends in Warcraft that they've never actually met in real life. I could almost say that we experience it in the near future lab discord. Like this is a very, I'm very digital prime when it comes to near future lab. Um, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I give a shit about, you know, how I interact with and engage with everyone here. And I want to be involved and I, uh, and it's like, Oh, there's a bunch of people all over the world that I could probably phone up if I was ever in your hometown and say, Hey, let's go grab a beer. And it would be, it would, it would work out. And I think that we're seeing that in the gaming world and we're seeing 10 year olds who might have more friends digitally and might care more about wearing that digital dressing up their digital avatar than they do about dressing up their physical meat space avatar. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, digital primacy and physical primacy, really, really interesting. It's a podcast. uh, It was on the interdependence in uh, a couple of years ago, David Rudnick, um, he's a graphic designer, uh, but he goes on about uh, digital and physical primacy. And to me, that was um, that was a um, a bit of a mind bending way of thinking about how to engage with people in the digital world and the importance of digital things. Yeah, Trey, there's a great. I may have referenced this before, but. That first, there was a podcast on Artifact, right? That just got bought by Nike, I think in 2021, maybe. Yeah. And I want to say his name is Benoit, French. Um, they, what I love about the way that they talk about digital fashion, which I think is how most people should talk about it, is they don't talk about it in these absolutes, right? Like you get a lot of companies like Ralph Lauren, or people in fashion who are like, we know what we're doing with digital fashion, which I think is a huge red flag, but Artifact talks about it and they pretty much only use the terms like exploration and experimentation with it. And which I think is the best way to talk about it, but they literally talk about their first digital drop of sneakers as being this experiment where they found youth. I say like youth, but people under the age of 25 having bought, they did physical and digital sneakers and people bought the digital sneaker And then they bought the physical sneaker as a token. And when they were interviewed about it afterwards, they were, they were informed that the digital was the primary, right? That was the, the value was on the digital and that the physical acted as a token of sort of like the experience, but nothing that they were ever going to really do anything with, but that the the digital was the thing that they cared the most about. Um, And that's how they knew that there was something to digital Hmm. fashion. Um, so what did they do with those sneakers, the digital sneakers? So that, that I don't, there hasn't been a follow-up with that. I think after that, they got acquired pretty quickly. Um, I mean, they've been, they have been around. They've been doing a lot of things mm-hmm. in fashion weeks. They've came out with like um, hoverboards for aliens in the future and things like that. Um, I think people put those. So I it's always they, the hoverboard. It's always the love hoverboard. The hoverboard <laughs> for an alien. Um, yeah, I'd rather yeah. just have a bubble. Well, and you know, an, an, another good example of a way of thinking about it is vinyl records. Uh, some people will buy the vinyl record, not even owning a record player, because you get that little card on the inside that allows you to download the MP3 or the or the the the, the lossless FLAC file. So you're getting your digital file. You're you're paying money. You're you're contr- mm-hmm. you're, you're helping um, the artist. And then you have this, this vinyl record, which looks awesome and you can touch it and you can smell it and it's awesome. And if you happen to have a record player, you get to listen to it in a wonderful warm analog sound. But the, to me, but the record is the token, mm-hmm. you know, like I'm going to listen to this music more on my phone and on my computer than I will mm-hmm. anywhere else. But if you come over, I'm going to pull that out and show you this awesome, you know, uh, record that, uh, that, that that just feels like a like a trophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. I think that this idea that digital is a way of looking at it as the primary thing, and the physical just being mm-hmm. uh, an artifact of you possibly owning it. And then I like that well, there's some. Sorry, Nick. I was just going to say what's interesting about that is that the digital has the use of listening to it, and it's a format that you can listen on multiple platforms. Right. The challenge here with avatars and all of that is is again the there's no ubiquitous platform for this stuff 
Well, beyond beyond the ubiquity of the platform, the, the, the function of it as well. Yeah. Like what 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 even would happen with an avatar? Um, mm -hmm. What is it that that you do? Because you like music has the the benefit as uh, are mm -hmm. like pretty JPEGs that the, the the function of it is to be consumed, to be kind of mm -hmm. um, to 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 look at, to hear, um, and it doesn't need to mesh with. It doesn't need to be integrated into an environment. Right. Um, uh, so. Uh, and and so like even even if something was inter interoperable like what what is the operation <laughs> what what is it right. that you do with it um uh, I I wrote a thing many years ago about the cascading open avatars that way that we have C cascading style sheets and CSS for web pages like if you could have it so that there's sort of a a persistent um, persona that can get filtered in terms of at least like mm -hmm. palette colors that come into any given set of games. I, don't, I haven't seen whether that sort of gets carried through. Um, one thing that I was thinking about in the context of fashion is that like a lot of the choices that people make um, are incredibly subtle uh, about the difference in in the angle of a of a seam or in the uh, or in the the the, the sort of the the distance and thickness of a hem and stuff like that um and uh they're they're subtle because those subtleties are recognizable because people are really familiar with them mm -hmm. uh, you know like if nobody'd seen a skirt before then no amount of like fiddling with the hemline would be particularly legible as a fashion thing because it's not a it's not a form it's not a motif that we're familiar with and and you kind of find that with really new things that they're they're very overdone uh before people settle into the sort of an increasing legibility for them um but there are places that we are familiar with uh, in digital space that um that can be toyed with and played with like that um and and there you know the if you look at um uh the alexa.com no longer um no longer updates, but there are the sites that tell you what the top 10 or 20 websites in the world are or so are and there are only like three or four of them are officially are, are porn but um you know the rest of them are the the usual suspects amazon google wikipedia those kinds of things um and so one thing that you could do with fashion is um you could you could can you can construct appearances and views of those top websites that are sort of representative of your own take the the benefit there is that you know you return to them you go to those spaces a lot uh, and they're also mutually recognizable. So if your Wikipedia looks slightly different to somebody else's Wikipedia, then that's like a very legible thing and a very interesting kind of talking point. Like if you ever looked at like, um, there's a website, wikiwand.com, and it, it's a really nice kind of front end, uh, a view that they've kind of augmented and changed of how Wikipedia could look, uh, and they've got a better chapter now, stuff like that. But um, yeah, like, so if, you were able to, and so this, this is possible to do. If you have something called a, you know, a browser extension, people have them for screenshots or for Pinterest or whatever. But you can make a browser extension that actually reads every web page or any web page or no web pages, whatever, um, and and sort of overrides and uh, and applies certain styles. And so if you have a particular kind of bent that you want to follow about how things are presented and how things look, um, then then you could sort of um, you could uh, intervene on these really common and legible spaces, at least for you, so that when you log into a Google Docs, when you go to these different things, they look mm -hmm. a certain way, maybe they behave a certain way. And taking it further, yeah. and I don't know how how possible it is with this, but like, um, it might be possible to 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 constrain or focus the the way that you actually interface with a Google Doc or or, or whatever by virtue of having a browser extension that both sort of formats and styles the the person who has its view, but also the impact they have on that Google Doc. You know what I mean? Ooh. So that wow. so that does does, yeah. does that sound does that like make any sense at all? Is that yeah. So and so yeah, like um, you know, so so uh, you know, like to, to that subtle thing, like right now, you know, Twitter.com has a border radius of a certain size. It has a set of color themes, set of color ways, and they're limited. Um, the web development, you know, people update things fairly continually, but it is possible. You know, I've done it a couple of times to Apple.com actually, where you you write sort of a, a tack on 
that um, that mm -hmm. fundamentally changes, but in a self-consistent and coherent way, what that thing looks like. So, for example, with Twitter, you wanted to just kill all of the border radii, radii then um, everything would be sort of sharp rectilinear, and uh, and it would be subtle, but it would be immediately noticeable for everybody who's in on what it is that Twitter looks like normally. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you could put shadows, you could put gradients, all of these kind kind of different things. Uh, uh, and especially if people are moving back and forth between, like you know, you were talking about the way that these um, uh, gender fluid uh, youth were were kind of world building. That necessarily entails that they're going back and forth between those worlds because it's not they're mm -hmm. they're creating these other things, these alter egos, and so they're so so like the experience is the richer for their being able to kind of experience Twitter through this, through that, you know, Google Docs, you know, all of these sort of public spaces uh, that can be formatable and reformatable. Yeah. I think I think that there's something really interesting in uh, being able to alter somebody's experience of those. Obviously, you know, laptop vinyl yeah. skins and, and phone screens and stuff like that as well. But but yeah, I, th I think there's something fun there. I mean, even going as far as uh, uh, pronoun switching on the sites. I mean, I do this all the time when I read to my girls every child's book is written with all male protagonists. And so I just gender switch ho the Hobbit into a girl crew or whatever. So like yeah. you could do that in a, in a plugin and, and you could have for a gender fluid, it could alternate or, you know, as, as you want and set those preferences. Totally different than external fashion. This kind of goes back to what you were saying, Kemp, about the, um, the movement of fashion to more, the more personal and telling a story side of things because you're not going to show that you're not going to be able to see that browser change except to people in your immediate vicinity um so so that, that's an interesting you know, alternative take on it yeah and it's interesting as you're saying about that that code switching or that pronoun switching um it does make me think about the way that even in future even within our lab i think we do the culture of the lab is is great in the sense that we're not we're not trying to hit a mark right like there's no like okay that was the wrong future right like i think that's important right i mean i i think that's an incredibly important thing when you're talking about the near future when you're you know having these ideation things and i've noticed with youth like so with this world building this one particular uh kid i was taught kid 22 year old i was talking to they kept saying, I don't know where it's going to go, or I don't know, right? Like there's a lot of like comfort in the fact that they're building it, but that it isn't static or defined or finished, right? I think that is very different than the way that I was raised or grew up. Um, and a lot of people that I know wanting there to be a lot of like concrete boundaries or de definition around things, right? Like for a millennial, if you you know, the pronoun stuff, if the reason this triggered was because Nick, how you're saying like pronoun is, you know, we need to know your pronouns and then those need to not shift, right? That's really tough for somebody over a certain age who's who's been mm -hmm. socialized a certain way. To a 22 year old, if you come in as non-binary and then you come in as trans male the next day, they're like, cool, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. To somebody of a certain generation, that's incredibly infuriating. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm, I'm speaking generally here. So, you know, bear with me on that. But I think that that goes back to this idea of world building, which is to our benefit of the way that we've structured the lab in the sense that we aren't looking to hit a finish line of what the future is, right? So I've noticed that this youth moment of like, I don't know what this is, or I don't know what this outfit is, right? This fashion, like I put on this doily and this scarf and these pants and all of this, I'm not sure what it is, but it's part of I've been drawn to it or I'm figuring out my identity through it. Like there's an exploration in it, which seems to, I'm seeing these links to the way that we're even ex talking about the exploration of the future. So there's something, Nick, as you were saying that it kind of, it feels in line with how people switch even in their world building, right? Like if this doesn't mm -hmm. work, right now, okay, I'm going to switch it up, right? The same way that we're like, okay, well, I was building this future, or this is how the future was going in my head and now it's not. So I'm going to switch that up. Um, I think previous models for lots of different like financial purposes, they don't accommodate that shift very easily. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the digital, I think digital ads, I think the digital 
element of this adds to that flexibility or that fluidity, right? So like, if we're talking about like the interface adapting to our digital prime, like if one day I'm feeling this, or if my identity shifts, it's much easier to shift my digital prime than it is to like buy all new physical things. Right. Okay, so then I'm loving where this conversation is going. So maybe so I can move forward. Um, some areas for me to look at, I'm kind of taking away that we don't know exactly how this would exist on a platform, whether we create or buy into a platform, correct? Okay, yeah. something we have to figure out. It sounds like we're pretty solid on the idea that this is not a static illustration. Um, that this does have some form of, um, I'm going to try to be very vague here, but that this has some sort of link, movement, uh, space. This has some sort of, the successor takes up an environment or creates an environment on its own somehow. There has to be some element of customers customization, which kind of lends itself to needing its own environment in order to do the customizations, right? Yeah. Unless it's directly built into the platform um, that we buy into, yeah. And then to do that customization, are we looking at, this is where my ignorance with this kind of comes into show here, is this something that, you know, I've talked with Jed and Jed's done these. Um, Julian, you've seen Jed's, uh, the avatars that he's created, right? Yeah, the, um, the, uh, the, the goat people, what are they? They're, what does he call them? Not minotaurs. Minotaurs, yeah, like these yeah. weird minotaurs. So when I first saw that work, I thought he did, did all that digital, he's done all that digitally, but I thought there was sort of an algorithm that made all that. And he was like, no, I've just gone in and done all that sort of like, quote unquote, by hand. So are we looking at, would this be something that we create sort of in a program and then we code? Am I using really layman language here? I think it uh, depends on where we want to go with it. There's also, yeah. I find sometimes that it's easy, like it, you, you end up prototyping it by hand to begin with. Yeah. You know, before you figure out. That's one way, or or it could be, um, the other the other way, is like purely generative. Like here's an algorithm. Like whatever comes out the other end of this, that's it. Yeah. There's, so I think you know, yeah. those are at least two ways. A lot of generative art. They call it generative art because the the artist is like, I write the I write the algorithm with no clear idea about what's going to happen on the other end because there are too many variables right. or, and they might go and like, ah, uh, that's not quite what I was dreaming about. Let me go in and change a few parameters or adjust the the way in which it, you know, mixes color with the weather outside kind of thing. Yeah, Julie, did you go to the Bright Moments Gallery down in Venice? I did not go there. Was that that was that was the crypto one? Is it still there? I think they I think they uh, closed the physical gallery. Yeah, Sam Franklin Fried. Yep, just didn't write them a check. <laughs> Yeah, I went to go watch them mint their crypto Venetians. And that was right. how it worked, right? Like that was their big thing, right? That, that was, was their it. big thing. Um, and then they went around the world, or the theory was they were gonna go around the world doing these like crypto Venetians or crypto crypto New Yorkers, or every city they went to, they were gonna like you were gonna wait in line or basically covet this ticket number, and then you were gonna get a a 8-bit or 16-bit print or file of some algorithm spewed out thing mm -hmm. and it was wildly popular for a minute and then and i wanted one really badly and then i was sort of like over it right why'd you want and one badly i'm curious i wanted one really badly because it was covid and i was bored and, <laughs> and i was like I, I i can't buy anything i can't want anything right now i'm so bored and so then this thing popped up and i was like getting into it 
And I was like, I, I got to get this thing. Yeah. And I was on the wait list. And then I was actually going to be in New York when they were doing their New York drop. And I was like, this seems really cool. And then I went and watched them do it. And I was like, this is really stupid. And it wasn't stupid because it inherently was stupid. I just felt like it was, it had nothing connected to me, right? Like you got something that was generated that didn't feel personal at all. Mm. And I think that's why I'm really enjoying where this conversation has been going about this idea of it being hyper-personal and possibly a link to whatever this identity, this like idea of building this identity that goes beyond just this one thing, but is like an accessory or building into a larger world that you're creating for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That crypto Venetian, I felt like, I guess what I didn't like about it was that I felt like I was just buying into someone else's version of digital art, mm -hmm. right? There was, it, I was just sort of like a pawn. There was nothing about me that felt, um, I could have been anybody in that line and they were going to spew out this algorithm, right? Right, right. And so how um, does that feed into what you're thinking about short coat digital? The accessories, I think it feels like it needs to have, whether if it is an algorithm, there needs to be, I feel like there needs to be some el element of customization that is personal, right? I don't think we, I don't want to give everybody the option to build anything that they want, but I also love the idea of, I mean, I've been staying in touch with some of these people because some people are having a hard time getting it who aren't part of the lab. Some of my friends who are more in fashion and the more I push them to think outside the box, like somebody keeps coming back with like, I want these shoes from this season. And I'm like, no, no, no. Think, think beyond this, right? Like, don't give me a, this year's Bottega Veneta sunglasses, right? And they're like, oh, okay. And so there's something about it that is giving people access to be creative that I kind of want to push. I know you can't force that, but um, going off on a tangent here, I guess I want there to be some level, I want there to be some constraints maybe, but I also want there to be an element of like, the algorithm isn't going to spew out something that doesn't have anything to do with you. I feel like that, that doesn't really feel authentic at all. That feels like you're just, you're at fashion week in head to toe Balenciaga and you don't know why you're there. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the equivalent of that feels like to me. Do okay. you want this to tie with the physical one? Like, do you want there to be like a one-to-one -one coordination between the accessories? Are we diverging? So in other words, that there would be a physical accessory made for the digital? Yeah, or vice versa, yeah. Yeah, I think in my mind, I envision, so as I'm going through the Miro board, there are some accessories that are, that have the ability to be made, right? Like the most, the most um, accessible one is the toolkit. So the idea that we could make an NFL toolkit that could then slide into the coat, like mm -hmm. a small toolkit um, that I love. And so then there's this idea of, and we've been using um, Tom Sachs as sort of like a benchmark, right? When he did the rocket launch, there's something about, I envision almost doing like a accessory hackathon or an accessory day where we could make prototypes of accessories and maybe we make one or two as like a physical drop. So if there's a digital accessory that ends up being wildly popular, like the future toolkit, and then we make a NFL toolkit that somehow fits into a pocket on the go, like that to me, I could see there being, I could see there being unexpected accessories that end up becoming physically made that do attach to the coat. And then the, the coat would act like a physical constraint to that possibly. Interesting. Yeah, one thing that was just like running through my head was that I don't remember who shared it, but a an AI made a bunch of spoons and then someone handcrafted or made these real physical spoons that an AI created. And like, is there some connection between the digital things and whether it's generative AI or we're, we're creating something to even a useless spoon that isn't actually usable in the real world or a useless item that you can put on your coat to represent physically your digital avatar. 
as a drop ship or a you know a custom manufactured 3D printed thing uh, could be one possibility of going. Yeah. I don't know. It's a wild west out here. I find myself going through this cycle of like I get really excited about it and then I'm like wait where where am I and then I get <laughs> really confused by it and then I get really then I'm like okay what are the like the nuts and bolts of what I'm doing mm-hmm. what we're doing and then I finally feel like I get a grasp on it and then I get excited about it again <laughs> kind of lose right. track where I'm at which I think is the point so, of it like that's what's like interesting that. yeah well, what gets me the most excited about the digital version is this idea in my head that it could be a Minecraft mod that I can customize my character to do different things or have different abilities built right in that can help me in the game or self-express my identity in it. And I, you know, the more Minecrafters that I watch, the more they're all getting into custom artifacts, custom hats, custom, you know, glasses, beards, all this stuff, all these, these custom features that they're doing to, again, self, it, tell their story in in this version they want to be a dwarf or in this version they want to do that and i feel like that chore coat in a minecraft world could be the layer that you can then build on to say okay i'm going to put on my dracula cape i'm going to put on my dragon costume and it's all just built into that api right of the chore coat and that's what do, gets me really moving on it do, in in minecraft do people have the ability to um, hook in extra extra data like um you know people aren't playing minecraft in a in an oculus quest pro but like right. can people hook in blinking uh or or you know because there there are um there are trackers that people can buy mm-hmm. for things for things like blinking or 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 extra data channels like can you can you change your skin dynamically in game for example i have not seen that yet but i don't believe that's impossible because all of these are just run in java and so you could have your java mod run an api to go hit if this then that or yeah yeah or your webcam um and a facial reaction you know yeah absolutely because that I that that's one of the places where um I feel like so the, the, the two the two big things that sort of fall down for me within the sort of the a digital conversation is like what is the intrinsic use of the of of a thing in a digital arena? And you know, like so my my brother makes or works with uh, makes a fluff world and it's it's cool, it's exciting sounding NFT, but it's just like there's no there's no there there. There's no reason for anybody to be there. There is a reason for people to believe in Minecraft. Also, a reason for people to be in Wikipedia, and that's why I think that, that right. those are two yeah. much more successful things. Um, uh, but then there's like, what's the correspondence between how we understand kind of fashion, and it also like if it's, right. it's supposed to be the chore coat, like what it is that the, the, the chore coat does to a space. Yeah. So yeah, what is the identity of the chore coat that we're taking between the spaces? Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and so, but for example, if we could animate textures in Minecraft, then, mm-hmm. and we can pull in data sources. So we sort of decide why and when and how we animate, mm-hmm. then we could do something like if there was a light sensor on a jacket, then you could update a Minecraft skin in real time based on the data that comes from that, you know, and yeah. you could, you could reduce right. things. So like, so for example, you know, you, you could, uh, you could, um, rather like it would be cheating in, in the Minecraft world, but you know, to, to be able to kind of see a space by turning a lot, turning on a light in your room or having mm-hmm. a light that is on, on your jacket that also then goes on in Minecraft, like, mm-hmm. uh, having, having changes that are affected, um, and can be meaningful or not, but are, are at right. least socially significant. So, or, or for be... those, or for those who are world building, um, based on their own preferences, like, um, I have a stream deck down here. I can't show it to you, but it's just got a series of buttons on it that I can change, like the color of my lights, for instance, with a click of a button. But if you have those as moods built into the API, then you can make a choice instead of having it accidental or in- incremental based on your personal uh, ex- 
uh, behaviors. It's more about your, your, your choices, which kind of fits that 25 year old aspect that we were talking about. Uh, but yeah, I think those, all those APIs, I think they're possible. I have a friend who's a, a mod developer and I can ask him to, maybe he can explore something, just a simple weather API that like, if it's raining outside, maybe it, the, your, your outfit turns blue. I don't know, just something simple to just explore the, uh, the idea, the concept of it. And I think, Brendel, to answer sort of that question, because I, I, I think it's it's great when we ask questions. Julian asked me a couple of questions about the physical chore coat last time I was there, and I was like, oh, this is great. It's always great to ask these and then, like, touch base with them. You know, how does the identity of the chore coat specifically relate to whatever, to the digital, right, is sort of how I was interpreting. You know, the chore coat is about, to me, is about working, right? Like, it's a, it's a worker's coat. Um, and so I think... This coat, the physical coat rests in a space of uniformity, right? Like mm -hmm. the idea that everyone can put on this coat and have a uniform. Um, but it is it is a coat in which one does things in, right? There's an mm -hmm. action in it. I don't see it as, it's not, it's not a robe, right? It's not, it's mm -hmm. not a, it's not a ball gown. Um, so you also got utility, right? It, it because... is utility. Yeah. And there's a sense of doing action in it. And I think the reason why I was I was so comfortable and on board with it as being the first piece of merch physically is that it it very much fits in line with the mission of NFL, right? Doing things rather than just talking about things. Um, and so I think that piece does go back into this idea of world building and or and maybe i'm using the word the term world building a little loosely here but this idea of people whether it be minecraft or um or another platform or like fortnite going out and doing things like this coat right the accessories that attach to this coat have an element of utility action um rather than pure decoration which i think sometimes fashion falls into um more iconography or mm -hmm. aesthetic you know it's not an, it's not just an aesthetic cue right it's not just uh, it's not just gucci logos on a bag right that at least that's not what i see it as um now the first question of in, its intrinsic use in a digital arena I think that that is something that from our conversation has been really, it's like, that's my big red flag is to stay away from it being to and not having use, right? Because it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I make it. I mean, it's like, I feel like there's the digital waste to me is, you know, like it would just become digital waste, right? Mm -hmm. um, did you have a third question in there, Randall? I can't, sorry to, I know that's, um, I think the third one was the, what is the, the really, well, is the, I guess it was, you no, know, it was the relationship within, between the, the sort of the physical chore code and the digital. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I, this has got me going in a lot of directions that are <laughs> interesting to think about. Yeah, I love this. And I'm, I'm grateful that you all are so comfortable with there not being concrete like we figured it out moments um this is where i thrive yes <laughs> <laughs> i love the vague the vague space that we can just explore and and mold yeah i try to go in very i try to go in with like okay purpose and then be vague allow there to be a lot of space for exploration and then come out with a couple things for me to to tackle moving forward mm -hmm. so that i'm not sitting here when I get off the Zoom being like, that was really cool. I have no idea what I just talked about, you know? Um, yeah. I think I'm going to move forward looking into more of the Fortnite and Minecraft skins. Most of my research has always been from fashion companies, but I think I want to look into more about how people are using them. Because I know like Louis Vuitton did a bunch of, fashion companies have been seeing the monetization of that, but I don't think they really have a reason for why they're doing it. Um, and then I think the big question really seems to be about like the use, like why is this thing, how does this thing, where does this thing exist and how is it being used, right? We don't have an answer for that. 
and that's right. okay. But I think the definite conclusion is that it does have it does need to have a use and it's not static. Um, okay, any other thoughts on this? I gotta bounce guys. Okay. Yeah. We can end it here. Um, I appreciate everybody chiming in today. This was really helpful for me. And um, maybe we'll do another one of these right after the holiday and keep going. And do you think with that, um, do, are we, uh, what am I gonna say? There are a couple of things I wanna catch up with you in particular on merch stuff, um, but not now, but the, you, you were talking about maybe going to someone's fab studio yes Scott, Scott, i feel like i had i thought there was an extra week between now and christmas which I we could we could add one yeah <laughs> <laughs> i really thought there was a week between now and next week um if you're around later today we can hop on a call and i can we can catch up i'm um, around later today and then i fly out to new york on monday but i'm happy to do another zoom i know next week is sort of a holiday week for a lot of people but i'm low-key for the holiday so if anyone wants to i'm totally talk okay anything, i'm around I'm, I'm, I'm around. Cool. This is awesome. I'm going to chime in on the office hours and probably update everybody on this call. So, um, and then I may ping some of you individually to clarify because you're all a lot smarter than me on this digital stuff. So this has been great. On, stop it. Uh, I also uh, eagerly await uh, Adam's contribution. He's, he's a, a silent on calls, but, um, but, but a big thinker. So uh, awesome. I, I look forward to that drop. Yeah is like sort of marinating into the oh, like, great the i'm gonna give him a direct message <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean not everyone can is comfortable thinking aloud and so it's it's nice to have the discord where you can have both the introverts and the extroverts all totally. types of thinkers available to and respond. the middle and the middle verts the in between the middle verts the omniverts yeah yeah i love that awesome nice. i only see zoom user um tell me the name uh, hi, my name is Adam Byrne, and I live in Stockholm, Sweden. Oh, nice. Um, and it's, and it's, so it's night here, it's winter here, it's snow here, and uh, really cold. It's always um, night at this time of year, isn't it? In some sense. Yeah, yeah, it is <laughs> night uh, <laughs> all day, almost. <laughs> it's dark all, all day. I'm literally surrounded yeah. by Swedes right now. My next door neighbor is from Stockholm, and his family just arrived yesterday into L.A., and they're staying in the apartments above me and next to me. So it's like, all I hear is Swedish. So, <laughs> uh, which, you know, sounds nothing like I can translate. So, but awesome. Great. Well, it was great to see you all. Thank you so much for joining and uh, chat with you all soon. Sounds great. Bye y'all. Bye.